name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to our webinar on the coming Cicada Palooza. Tonight's presenter is Cicada expert, Dr. Jean Kritzke, who is Professor Emeritus of Biology at Mount St. Joseph University in Cincinnati, Ohio. He's the author of 10 books, including A Tale of Two Broods, The 2024 Emergence of Periodical Cicada Broods, 13 and 14, no, so, sorry, 13 and 19, which was published in 2021 by the Ohio Biological Survey. As you can imagine, he is very much in demand as a speaker this year, and we're lucky to have him here tonight. A big thanks to our co-sponsors of this event, the Friends of the Green Bay Trail, particularly Becky Maganuco and Meredith Clement, and the Glencoe Sustainability Task Force. Thank you all for being here tonight as we welcome Dr. Jean Kritzke. Take it away, Dr. Kritzke. Good evening. How are you doing? I know what you're all thinking. He's a college professor. Uh, it's going to be 50 minutes. There's going to be a quiz afterwards. No, I'm not trying not to be that way. I'm going to try to make you all cicada experts in the next uh, half hour to 40 minutes and uh, get you ready for what's going to be an exciting time. Uh, the last time we had a dual emergence like this between broods 13 and 19 was in 1803 when Thomas Jefferson was president of the United States. And like those, like that time, uh, we uh, will have two distinct broods emerging here. In northern Illinois, in Chicago area, we'll have brood 13, which is a 17-year cicada. And then brood 19, we'll see here is on the uh, right with the red dots. That's a 13-year cicada that's extending over many of the southern states. Why these numbers? Well, it turns out whenever we talk about broods, brood numbers one through 17 are reserved for 17 year cicadas and broods number 18 through 30 are reserved for 13 year cicadas. And after entomologists decided to adopt that, that major system of, of numbering these things, we started to see that there were not 30 broods, but really only 15 broods today. There are 12 different broods of of 17-year uh, periodical cicadas and three broods of 13-year cicadas. So even though we have a double emergence again this this year, and that happened 221 years ago, in reality, that happens about a little more than 30 times every 221 years because 12 times three is 36. So it has the potential of had going up as many as 36 times in that, time, in that period. So uh, what you're seeing is, of course, in blue is referred to as the Great Northern Illinois Brood. And then Brood uh, 19 uh, is a, 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 the Great Southern Brood because it occurs throughout the southern half of Illinois and Missouri and into Arkansas and the southern states and so on. What makes this particular emergence so much more exciting compared to other dual years is that there's an area of overlap. And that area of overlap right here is along Sagamon County in, in Illinois. And it's not going to be a large overlap. And you're not going to be able to tell if you're in it because, as you'll see in a little bit, the cicadas look alike, whether they're 13 or 17 years cicadas. So uh, uh, that's kind of an exciting thing. Compared to the past, last time this happened was in 2014 when Brood 3 emerged with Brood 19, but they were nowhere near each other to have an overlap. And even before that, in 1998, when uh, Brood 4 emerged with Brood 19, they were miles and miles uh, apart. So those are the areas we want to go. So let's see, what are you going to see first? Uh, it's quite probable that in mid-April, especially after a nice heavy rain in a wooded area that has exposed mud, you might see these little cicada turrets coming out of the ground. What happens if the soil has got a lot of clay in it, much of this area, the, these forests do, uh, the cicada nymph going up and down that tunnel smooths out the sides. So when it starts raining really heavy, water can accumulate in these in their larval, in their, excuse me, their nymphal tunnels. To extend it, they'll build these chimneys, much like crayfish do, that can extend two to three inches above the ground. The largest I've ever collected was about six, uh, but I have there are reports in the historical record of them being almost as much as 10 to 12 inches in height. But they'll look like this that you see here, these little balls of mud that the cicada has sort of built up into a little, a little chimney, if you will. Inside here, there's a cicada. After the rain stops and the water slowly percolates out, it'll crawl back down into its burrow, uh, its tunnel, and uh, remain there until it's ready to, to observe. So... That's what we want to be looking for in mid-April, uh, mid to late April. Uh, after a heavy, heavy rain, look for these things out in the woods uh, or under a deck. If there's mud underneath that where they can accumulate or, or some, near in some protected area but where there's exposed mud. Then when the soil temperature reaches 64 degrees Fahrenheit, and in, in uh, Chicago, this happened the, in the second and third week of, of uh, 
uh, May in 2007. Uh, that's when the, the cicadas start to come out. But they all don't come out in one day. The emergence takes about two full weeks to be, to be completed. And so what, why is that? It's because if you've got some trees on a hill facing south, that soil will get warmer than the trees on the north facing hill facing north because it's not in direct sunlight. And so it takes two full weeks for all the cicadas in a given area to get out of, the, of their nymphal tunnels. And so that's why when this thing starts, it tends to last like six weeks because those last few that are emerging towards the end of the emergence time, they'll live on average another month unless they get eaten by a bird or a raccoon or something like that. These holes that you see here are the size and the diameter of your pinky. And it's how we measure how many cicadas are, emerge, are emerging. We take a, a quadrant, we lay it over the holes and we count all the number of holes. And you do that enough times, you get sort of get a, a general average. And uh, Hank Dibus, Henry Dibus, who was a, a, a very good friend of mine, he's now no longer with us, but he was a, a curator at the Field Museum. Uh, and uh, he uh, did a census back in the 1950s and found that in the, in the Chicago, Chicago suburbs and the wooded areas, you can have as many as one and a half million cicadas emerging per acre. Now it's acreage under trees, not out in the fields. So you have a, if you have a tree line golf course, they're not going to come up in the fairway. They'll emerge from under the trees. But that... Uh, I, my measurements here in greater Cincinnati in the suburbs, we were getting about three quarters of a million per uh, uh, underground, under tree acreage. Uh, it's not as much as a million and a half, but three quarters of a million cicadas is still a lot of bugs. So when the soil temperature is just 64 degrees Fahrenheit, and then what I've found over the last 50 years is working on these insects, after a nice soaking rain, that's when they start to pop up. And they literally pop right out of the soil. Here's one that I took. Uh, while I was with, working with a Ch Japanese uh, film crew and we had lights on trying to get one coming out of the ground, the lights were scaring them from coming out. So we turned around and looked in all the dark areas. Here they were popping up around us. But here's one that just has, has emerged from the soil. Uh, it then tries to find a, a vertical surface and they start climbing. And they climb up this surface uh, eventually to uh, lock their legs into the bark. They'll also climb up on tires. I've seen them on brick walls. I've seen them on tombstones. Uh, and if there's hard, if the trees are further away apart, they'll even do this on 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 uh, shrubbery, but even on blades of grass if they can find a, a a surface that's solid enough. And what happens is after a few minutes of sitting there, they'll they're the back of the nymphal back on the thorax starts to split, as you see here, and there's this creamy white. That's the adult cicada. The adult cicada is going to gradually start pulling itself out. And as it pulls itself out, it sort of lifts itself, wiggles its way out of that cicada, the, the nymphal shell, eventually hanging nearly upside down. You'll see these, these filaments here. Those are the tracheal tubes, the part of the respiratory system of the cicada that gets pulled out of the adult because that, that's part of the system that was allowing the nymph to breed, uh, breathe, excuse me, not the adult. And so uh, I often tell my uh, my colleagues, if you thought puberty was rough, when cicadas emerge from their shell, it's 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 intense, and it is going to occur in about a, a, a thirty minute a, a three hour period over now in this part here. We're talking about it takes about an hour and a half. Eventually, the cicada will do a sit up. It'll grab hold of the nymphal skin and slowly wriggle its abdomen out of the shell. And here you have an adult cicada now free of the the nymphal skin, the exuvium, and what you see are the bright red eyes. These three little, that little triangle of red that you see, that's the ocelli, the simple eyes. The black areas are sclerotized exoskeleton where the muscles are attached to allow it to pull itself out of its out of its shell. The wings are all shriveled, as you see here. So they're going to slowly start to pump fluid through those wings to expand them. And eventually, the wings will be tent-like over the abdomen, looking very much like a cicada, but it's all white. We call these tenoral adults because it hasn't, it's now shed its skin, it's expanded its wings, but it hasn't hardened its exoskeleton. Up to this point here, right, from coming from the ground to this point here, takes about 90 minutes on an average uh, May uh, evening. They'll start coming out of the ground after sundown. They'll be coming out of the ground all through the night. And even into the next morning, you might see some of these uh, still hanging onto trees, shedding their skin uh, as this occurs. So 90 minutes to get to this point. Now we have to get the cicada darkened, and that takes another 90 minutes. And so that, that adult cicada will climb up to the tops of the trees and continue to harden the exoskeleton to uh, mature their, their reproductive organs. And they'll sit up there for about four or five days. 
After five days, they'll start singing and they'll start flying. Uh, so when you see, when you start hearing calls, sort of the the the, the weak saw chorusing, know that indeed that met that cicada has been out of the ground now for five full days. You get up the next morning after this has happened, and you might find out your whole yard littered with these spent uh, cicada uh, exoskeletons. I call I call them shells. And this was so heavy in, in, in this particular emergence that they were hanging on blades of grass. I've seen emergences where if you shine a flashlight over the lawn, the grass is all moving because it's so full of cicadas. It's, it's quite amazing. So to go through this, so you can actually see what's gonna, how this works, I'm going to show you a short video that shows this whole process speeded up. But what you're looking at is going to be about a, a two to four, two to three hour uh, thing to take place in, in uh, real life. So it's now locking its its tarsi into the into the uh, into the bark, and it sits there for several minutes, and then it'll start wriggling its abdomen, and now it's going to start splitting its nymphal skin, and you can see the adult inside. Sometimes they lose their grip, and if they do that and they fall on the ground, they might they end up dying because they're stuck in their shell. Uh, but in this one, he was able to keep uh, attached to the tree, pulling himself out, just wriggling away, just wriggling. Just, now the wings are free and it's hanging there, held in place only by the tension of that opening of the nymphal skin. It'll hang there for a few minutes. And as this is going on, his, his uh, uh, exoskeleton is getting a little bit harder. He's getting the, the ability to actually sit up, if you will. This was shot in the very early morning. You can see the sun's coming up now. And now it's wriggled its abdomen free and it's going to expand its wings. And eventually it'll have it'll look like a typical cicada with the wings tent-like over the abdomen. There we go. There we go, it's folded its wings down. And now it'll probably, it's, it can stay here and turn dark or it will sometimes walk away as you'll see in a second, uh, where it'll begin the darkening process where that darkening process goes hand in hand with hardening the exoskeleton. And uh, we should be in clarity, he walks away. There he is already beginning to turn dark. So that's that whole process. When you have, if you're lucky to have this in your backyard, get your kids. Go out there and watch. It's just like having David Attenborough in your backyard filming a nature special. This will go on every night for about two full weeks. More coming out the first the first week than the second week. But eventually your shrubbery will look like this as more and more cicadas emerge. After five full days and they're singing, more continuing to emerge, they'll start to gather in trees. And as you can see here, this is a subdivision in Cincinnati where uh, they had a few cicadas, to say the least. And then after, by the end of the first full week, you'll start hearing, uh, five, end of the first week, you'll hear some sublight calling. But as you get into the second and the third week, that calling gets more and more intense. This is a chorus. You'll see some cicadas flying around in here. Uh, what's going on is all the males gather in trees and they chorus. And if they haven't, Seen or heard a response from a female cicada, they'll get in the fly to another branch somewhere and try again. Now, if only the males sing, they have timbals, special structures that allow them to make a noise. Their abdomen is hollow like a resonating chamber that amplifies the sound. And uh, after, uh, uh, and, and so the, the male will sing. And if the female is nearby and she responds, she responds by flicking her wings. If he hears that, he'll turn walk towards her, he'll see again, she'll flick her wings, and then they go into a, a secondary mating call where she doesn't flick, but he, he positions, if she doesn't fly, doesn't fly away, you'll find them eventually engaging in copulation. Sometimes there's competition, though. The competition is when that first male, when he's singing, as he gets to the point where the female should flick her wings to uh, uh, show the male she's interested, another male will start singing, delaying her response till she he gets to his call, and then he might turn, she might turn and... Uh, uh, attract his attention and and uh, he and he lost out on that particular mating opportunity. So what we're going to see this year in Illinois, that's one of the exciting things about this dual mergers, is all seven species of periodical cicadas are going to appear this year. In northern Illinois, in the Chicago area, you're going to see only the thir the 17 year cicadas from brood 13. And if you look at the, they all look alike across this this slide here. They all black bodies, red eyes, orangish wings. If I go back here, uh, there we go. The uh, the underside is how you tell the species apart. 
There's one that's larger than the other two. This is Magus Cicada Septendecim. It's got this orange and black alternate with thick orange bands here. Magus Cicada Cassini has no orange on the other side of the abdomen. And Magus Cicada Septendecula has very narrow, very thin orange lines, and it's smaller than the, the decim species. If you drive down to south, central Illinois, south of uh, Springfield, you'll see all, the all four species. This one here, Cassini, uh, Tretacassini and Cassini are impossible to tell apart by looking at, apart by looking at them. Uh, Trede uh, Tredecula looks just like Septendecula. There are two sp larger species here. This is Tredecim, uh, this is Tredecim here, and this is Neotredecim. Their calls are identical, except they are at different pitches. So they really truly are different species. So you have an opportunity in Illinois this year, if you're willing to drive a little bit further south, to see all four periodical cicada species that occur in the in this in the state. As a as the uh, emergence continues, uh, the shells, uh, the the spent shells, if you will, the the and dead cicadas will start accumulating at the base of trees, and this can be quite this can be quite a, a number. Uh, there have been times in the past where people have reported actually shoveling these off of their uh, from around their yard because there's so many, so many of these shells accumulating. Uh, where are the adults? The adults are up in the trees. And uh, uh, this is from my backyard uh, here in Cincinnati. And as you can see, they're just lining up. And what they do at night is they tend to walk to the underside of the tree and hang out because of the heavy dew that might, might precipitate over uh, over the evening. Uh, but uh, uh, they're if, if uh, they're they're waiting to find a mate, if they are, if uh, once they do find a mate. Uh, here's a mating pair up in the upper left-hand corner. And indeed, uh, uh, the, the male, I'm looking at male cicadas, we find that about 85% of the males will mate only once. 10% uh, will mate twice, and only 5% will mate three times in their life. Uh, as far as the female goes, she has on average around five, a little more than 500 eggs. Uh, I had a student work with me a few years back to find out what was the average number. And we counted, we kept counting eggs until we got to 30,000. And we found that the average was 509 with a range of about 400, just, just over 600. So 500 is a good example. And bear in mind when you see the cicadas emerge and see all these insects, they've got a one-to-one -one male to female ratio. And um, imagine that for every two cicadas, 500 eggs can be laid and you get an idea about how many cicada eggs were laid to produce these massive numbers. And of course, these massive numbers are critical for their survival. The cicadas come out in big numbers to satiate or overwhelm their predators. Basically, the predators get to eat all the cicadas they want and there are still millions left. I've seen uh, everything from dogs, cats, chipmunks, squirrels, deer, spiders, uh, not spiders, yes, spiders, uh, spiders, uh, scorpion flies, as well as turtles and snakes. I think I may have mentioned the snakes eating these things. I've seen deer actually uh, graze on cicadas as well. So this opportunistic pulse of food is very beneficial because it allows uh, some of the, the birds and some of the smaller mammals to actually uh, have a greater food supply in the spring so that more of their offspring will survive. So that's beneficial as uh, for those those predators. On the lower right, you see a... a uh, a female ovipositing, and here you can actually see her ovipositor that she uses. She saws into the terminal end of a, end of a branch, and her her ovipositor is like two serrated knives on a central axis that she can saw into the bark and deposits twenty to thirty eggs, twenty to forty eggs uh, in a half inch area, and then she withdraws the ovipositor, walks about a half inch down, and does this again, and she keeps doing it until she either runs out of twigs and if twig, and if she runs out of twig, she finds another one. And when she runs out of egg, she stops and she'll die a few days later. And uh, this happens, this will start happening uh, within uh, three weeks of the emergence. And you can easily uh, see that. You see, here's a female uh, ovipositing. You can even see the, her abdomen pulsing. And she's laying a set of eggs. Meanwhile, around her, thousands of cicadas are, are, are screaming. And you can hear there was a car there, so it uh, it uh, was it was pretty close by the road. Uh, the egg nests are easily seen, and here you see one here. Uh, the that serrated ovipositor is uh, able to uh, tear up 
the twig, if you will. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily hurt the tree. In fact, uh, uh, in some cases, these egg layings, as you'll see in a minute, actually can be beneficial like a natural pruning. Uh, but each one of those little, these little egg nests, which you can see here by this, that's one egg nest here, here's an egg nest here, an egg nest here, an egg nest here. They're gonna have between 20 and 40 eggs in each one of those. And the eggs will hatch uh, in about uh, uh, six to 10 weeks, depending on when they're, on, when, on whether they're laid, the, the, usually six to 10 weeks, depending on temperature as well. But uh, usually we start seeing them hatching in, the, in, uh, in, in early to mid uh, July. Now, sometimes when the female lays her eggs in these uh, branches, uh, the twig will break, especially if there's a, a big heavy rainstorm or a, a windstorm or hail, and that causes the tree, the branches to uh, break, hang there and wither. And we call that flagging. And this is what's the natural pruning. Uh, all these branches, they looked unsightly. But they're not hurting the tree at all. In fact, uh, a paper published back in the 19th century titled Out of Evil Cometh Good. And it was it was cherry farmers in, in southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois were reporting that they, they got hit hard by the cicadas uh, uh, the previous year. But then the following year, the flower set uh, was just enormous. And so they, they came back with uh, a larger crop that following year. Now, when it flags, that's not beneficial at all for the for the um, cicadas. The uh, it, the that as that branch dries out, that will kill some of the eggs laid there, and indeed that mortality could be as many as half the eggs laid in that uh, in that uh, uh, brown brown uh, branch broken branch. However, you'll see there's a lot of branches there that don't have brown, and in those cases, up to ninety four percent of the eggs uh, laid in those egg nests will indeed hatch. So uh, again, the numbers are going to be astronomical coming in another 17 years if you're living in a brood 13 area. Also about this time, oh, a good three weeks into the emergence, uh, you'll start noticing some of these cicadas have white abdomens. And this is a fungal infection, which uh, the uh, uh, cicadas can get. Uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, infection. Uh, it, we don't know how the uh, initial infection occurs, but we know that it does spread through uh, uh, copulation, so it's a sexually transmitted cicada disease. Uh, but the whole abdomen will fill up with the with hyphae, and the, the and sometimes, as you see in the, the right hand picture, it breaks. And in the one on the left, you can see the one in the middle here. Uh, it's it's all white. The abdomen has fallen off completely. But what this does is something interesting. It changes the behavior. Uh, one of the active ingredients is the same ingredients found in magic mushrooms, and so it changes their behavior. Uh, and and a male cicada infected with this fungus will respond to another seeing male, he'll respond like he's a female. And when the male comes in to, to mate with his potential, his potential mate, he doesn't mate, he gets inoculated with more fungus as well. Uh, so this happens towards the end of the, uh, of the uh, four weeks of, of, of the cicada's life. Uh, and uh, you'll start seeing these, I've seen infection rates as, much, as high as uh, one, uh, three out of every 10, 30% infection, but usually it's more like uh, 10 to 20%. You'll start seeing with these, uh, these uh, uh, fungal spores. Then the next thing to wait for is hatching. And when the cicada nymphs hatch, they crawl out of the uh, egg nest, which is in those, the tips of the tree branches. They crawl out through the hole that the female made when she laid the eggs. And they literally just fall to the ground. They rain to the ground from the trees. They don't crawl down the tree. That would take too long. At this stage, these nymphs are extremely sensitive to predation. Spiders, ants, beetles go crazy for these things. So three years ago when Brood 10 emerged, I set up a hatching station and I was able to collect one hour cicada nymphs. These, these were born uh, just one hour before I took this video. And you gotta say, they are awfully cute when they're small, aren't they? And so these are the skittles that will next be seen as adults in, in 2038. But uh, uh, what I did with these, after I, I took videos and, and uh, uh, measured them and, and observed them for a while, I took them to a, a, a maple tree but by yard, which already had egg nests from 17 years earlier. Uh, and I dumped them in the soil uh, to see what happened. And they were gone, they were gone within a minute most of them within 30 seconds again they're so vulnerable to predators they got to get out of out of sight quickly so what they do is they find a blade of grass or where that blade of grass is coming through the soil there's a little little space there they went right down in that space 
Um, but of but the, of the fifty or so I observed, mo on, some took just under a minute. Most of them were gone within within thirty seconds. Uh, but that's highly adaptive. What they do is they feed on grassroots for the next uh, the next several uh, weeks, and then by New Year's Day. Yes, I went out, dug them up on New Year's Day one year. Uh, they are eight to twelve inches below the surface, sucking on a tree root. And that's where they're going to be. Not on that same route, but they'll they'll move around, but probably no more than a yard under that tree for the next 17 years. If they burrow the wrong way and they're going away from the tree, uh, they're going to starve and die. But they're they're tunneling around between eight to twelve inches below the surface. As they get older, and they'll while they're under there, they're going to molt four times. Uh, as they molt into the third and the fourth uh, stage, they'll move a little closer to the surface, being more like about eight or uh, six to eight inches below the surface, especially in the last uh, the last uh, four to five years, and uh, also feeding on a tree root. And that's very, that that tree root free, uh, feeding is extremely uh, important. Uh, one of the things we've discovered in recent years is that how do cicadas count the years? Well, it turns out they can, they they're xylem feeders. You might remember xylem and phloem from your, your biology class days, but xylem is the, the, the vascular system that absorbs water and takes water and minerals up to the leaves. The phloem is what takes the sugar from the leaves down to the rest of the tree. And so these cicadas are feeding on the xylem tissue, this, this very nutrient poor uh, 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 solution. And um, during the winter, when the trees uh, go dormant because of the, of, of the cold temperatures, in the spring, when it gets warm up, they can detect that fluid flow, that increased fluid flow, up feeding the leaves and the flowers that are being produced. And that's how they count the years. How did we determine that? Well, it turns out we've had a, a lot, both experiments in greenhouses, but also in, in areas where uh, uh, there was, I'll give one very specific example. In 2006, December, 2007, January, we had an extremely warm uh, winter here in Cincinnati. We had 70 degree temperatures for the high, and the leaves in my backyard started to leaf out. The trees started to leaf out, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, the uh, result was uh, in December, we had greenery on the trees. Come February, a hard freeze, those leaves uh, dropped. We had a hard freeze in, in February into March. Then in April, true spring occurs and they the tree leaves out again. And in Eastern Cincinnati, where cicadas were expected the following year, Thousands of cicadas came out a year early because they thought a 17th year had passed. So we've seen this in the field. We've also done, uh, well, colleagues of mine have also done uh, uh, overtopping uh, studies in greenhouses and been able to induce them to come out a year early by changing that that leaf, uh, that, that fluid flow in the xylem. So we now know how they count the years. What we don't know is how they remember what the count is. That's something we want to find out. So that's what that's what's going to be happening. Uh, what again? What's happening this year in particular that, that's making everything so special is what's happening in in Illinois. Illinois is home to five periodical cicada broods: uh, brood three, uh, brood uh, ten, uh, brood thirteen, brood uh, nineteen, and twenty-three. So, in the, here you see a map. This map was produced by my PhD advisor at the University of Illinois, uh, Lewis Standard, and as you'll see. On the far left, this is the combined map of all the broods. They tend to be, they tend not to overlap a lot, but they are areas of overlap. And we have an overlap zone right in here. And um, in 1998, uh, I actually went down with uh, Dr. Monty Lloyd. He's uh, now seems to be a very, a very important cicada researcher from the University of Chicago, and and we found trees that had egg nests from, even though know, they didn't come out the same year, but they had egg nests from brood 13 and brood 19 in the same trees. So we know there's some small overlap. Now, a lot of people this year, I think, got excited the idea that this is going to be like twice the number of cicadas coming out. And it turns out in reality, looking at this distribution here, the the this is the end of the range of brood 13. Here's the top of the range of brood 19. And that's where the numbers of cicadas are lower. So even if they if you know you're in a, if you find an area where they're overlapping, you can't be certain because the only way you can tell that they're uh, that, that they're uh, overlapping is if they had numbers on their wings and they don't. So it's harder to verify you're in an overlap zone. But the numbers of cicadas will not be abnormally higher in that area because it's at the edge of both their their distributions. Now one of the uh, so uh, um, 
that's a, a, a important thing. So here up in, in the Chicago area, we've had a, a wonderful series of histories of, of cicadas in the last four years. We had a major four-year acceleration of periodical cicadas in uh, uh, the year 2020. And uh, uh, the, 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 the sign that we saw was so, so many cicadas count in all, all sorts of areas around greater Chicago that they sang, they attracted mates, the females laid her eggs, and the eggs hatch. Those are four-year accelerations which can spring up a whole new brood. And so it turns out the next time we expect to see thir uh, brood 13 in the Chicago area will be in, in uh, uh, 2041. However, in 2037, which would be a brood nine year, parts of greater Chicago very likely will have large numbers of cicadas emerging. And if they are met are joined by other accelerating brood 13 cicadas that could be enough to establish a whole new brood that's very exciting for us that study cicadas because when you find adjacent broods to eat with each other especially 17 year cicada broods they tend to be adjacent broods that are four years apart brood 14 is next to 10 which is spinning up six now five is adjacent to a nine is adjacent to five which is adjacent to one four years apart we got two life cycles 13 and 17 four years apart so there's something exciting about that uh that that we're looking at and so uh, we're quite uh, uh quite excited about what's going to happen this year because of the the these two broods emerging in this potential overlap zone uh so uh the next time you'll see cicadas after this year uh, in the greater Chicago, uh, definitely will be in 2041, but parts of greater Chicago should have cicadas in 2037 and all as well. Uh, and so here's a, a photograph of a uh, uh, magic cicada septum decim. This is the, the large of the 17, large of the 317 uh, uh, year cicadas, heavy ba orange banding on the underside, but also of orange band between the eye and the base of the wing. That's diagnostic. So that's what to expect. It can be expected this year. What I'd like to ask you to do is to uh, help. I'd like, if we can, to get you to help with the, the mapping of our cicadas. Uh, I'm, uh, I work with the Center for IT Engagement. We've created the, the free app called Cicada Safari. Many of you may have used it in, uh, in the year 2020 when they had the four-year acceleration, uh, Brood 13. But this is a free app. It's available on the App Store and uh, Google Play. Uh, we asked for your email, but we do not. We have never shared an email address with anybody. Uh, uh, but we, the, the, it's necessary for two reasons. One, there have been instances where people reported some cicadas from places I didn't expect, and so I emailed them and talked to them about what they were, and and, and communicate with them about it. was this a real emergency? Were you somewhere else, and your your uh, location services or GPS wasn't working properly? What have you? We want to verify that. Uh, back in 2021, with Brood 10. Uh, Cicada Safari was downloaded by 200,000 people, and we received over half a million photographs, making it the largest uh, uh, map of Brood 10 ever. And with your help, we could do that for Brood 13, and we could do that for Brood 19 in Southern Illinois. So uh, I, I would I, I ask you if you if you are fascinated by cicadas, and if you're listening, you probably have a real interest in in cicadas. Uh, it'd be great if you would uh, help us do this mapping. It's very simple. You get the map. Uh, you'll see there on the right-hand side, uh, there's a bunch of screens. You touch that picture, and underneath it will be a whole description of what you should be looking for. It's got instructions on how to take a good photograph. Later, when the cicadas are singing, you can submit a 10-second video, which has the audio, and I can hear the species that are calling. That's also very helpful as well. They're verified by human eyes, and once they're verified, they go onto a live map, and down here at the bottom of the screen, there's a, an icon for map. You touch that, and it'll have a little cicada icon exactly where the cicadas have been reported. You can even zoom in on that icon and see photographs of the cicadas that people are reporting. And so what you'll expect to see is cicadas will start emerging the last week of April in Georgia, in Alabama, and Mississippi, and Louisiana. The first week of, tennis of, of May, you'll start seeing them in Southern Tennessee. The second week of May, you'll see them in Southern uh, Illinois and uh, parts of Kentucky and uh, into uh, 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 southern uh, you know, southern and Missouri. And then as you get the third, se second to the third week, depending on how warm the, the uh, spring is, you'll start seeing them emerging in central Illinois. And back in uh, 2007, uh, they emerged in uh, uh, Lake County uh, the weekend of the uh, the first weekend in uh, in June. It was a relatively cool spring that year. I've had the pleasure of, of um, mapping Brood 13 in the greater Chicago area in 1990. I came back and in uh, in 2007 to do it again. 
And uh, so I'm looking forward to reemerging in Illinois, uh, where I went to high school in Freeport, and uh, uh, and I spent a lot of time in uh, in North Lake and Elmhurst growing up. So uh, I'm looking forward to coming back home and and seeing the cicadas in, uh, from Brood 13. If you've enjoyed the presentation, uh, you would like to learn more. I would uh, rec like to recommend my book, The uh, Tale of Two Broods, published by the Ohio Biological Survey. Uh, and uh, if you would like, to, uh, if uh, it's available as an ebook and in paperback. Also, uh, uh, cicadasafari.org is the website that supports the the app, and there's a link in the uh, on the in the app to the uh, website. But on the website, you're going to find activities for kids. There's cicadas that you can color, how to fold an origami cicadas, uh, for example. Uh, projects you can do if uh, if uh, your your kids have. Uh, are lucky enough to have uh, grandparents and maybe even great great grandparents alive. They'll have them interview. You do an oral history and sort of what, what they remember of cicadas. Uh, but that's when they need to think about periodical cicadas. They are bugs of history, and they are generational when they come out. And if you have young kids or grandkids, they will never forget what's going to happen this year in Chicago with Brood Thirteen emergence. So I hope you'll help us map Brood Thirteen. And 19, if you have get out of the, get out of uh, get down to the sun part of the state, but uh, I, I I hope you'll enjoy the emergence as much as I will. And uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much. That was really interesting. Um, I learned so much, and and your enthusiasm is is contagious. Thank you very much, Dr. Kresge. Um I, I have, have a few questions of my, my own, and then there are some in the, the Q&A section also. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so if you're ready for a few questions. Um, okay, great. Um, a couple of people wrote in um, concerned about the effects of insecticides on, on uh, cicadas. Should some people want to know, should they try to put them out? Uh, others worried that it would affect them, especially the ones that are put in lawn areas for grub control. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, even though cicadas are, are, there are some pesticides labeled for cicadas, they don't do very well. Uh, uh, the, 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 if, for example, ground things for grub control, you're, they're mostly concerned about tur turf grass pests. Uh, and the cicadas are feeding on the tree roots, so they're not going to get much that's in the on the turf. And, and as far as spraying them on the trees, you've got to spray them when they're on the tree. You can't just spray and think that they're going to land and, and you'll have a significant die on. Uh, so we don't recommend using uh, pesticides uh, because it's uh, it's not it's not going to control it. Uh, and if you if you live in an area where cicadas emerged uh, will be emerging this year, uh, the cicadas underground have not hurt your trees. And uh, the only thing that that can hurt a tree would be when the female lays her eggs in the terminal growth of that tree branch. So what you want to do is one of two things: one. Don't plant any new small saplings this year until after the cicadas are gone. That's after the 1st of uh, July. Uh, if you have a young tree that you planted last year and you're worried about it, once you start hearing them, once they've started coming out of the ground, you can get a net, not a plastic bag, but get netting and cover the branches so that the cicadas can't get to the branches to lay their eggs. Don't wrap it up like a Q-tip, <laughs> but uh, leave it on there until the cicadas have stopped singing. And then you can take that off. You don't want to leave it all summer because that, that'll be hard for uh, bad for the tree. But uh, uh, usually, if you're if you had a, a large tree, they're not going to harm that at all. It may look ugly if you have a lot of uh, egg laying damage and flagging going on, but uh, uh, it's not recommended that uh, we spend the money on uh, pesticides to control cicadas. Plus, pesticides are are non-specific. They kill a lot, a lot of beneficial insects, and cicadas really aren't hurting anything. They're they're just what they are. Um, so, um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, somebody was asking, um, what about cicada noise? Does that does that um, occur at all times of day or is it particularly at night? Do we just notice it more at night? Um, how far well, into the night do they sing? Basically, yeah. they stop, they'll, the periodical cicadas generally will stop singing shortly after sundown. They, uh, if they sing at night, they're ad the males are advertising to predators, there's a cicada here. So at night they tend to stop singing, and the female and they won't be able the female will be able to fly close to them. There's just not a lot of activity. They'll, they'll just hang out under a tree. Uh, so uh, uh, what they'll start singing usually around ten in the morning or so, ten to eleven, depending on how hot it is. Uh, they'll get louder in the afternoon, uh, and then they'll start quieting down uh, as you get more towards sundown, uh, and then it'll stop overnight. 
if you uh, go to a cicada woods uh, where they're, and you spend more than 20 minutes there and you get back in your car and if it's a heavy chorusing, it'll be like going to a, a, a rock concert. You'll hear that in your ears for uh, several minutes. So you want to, uh, if you're, if you have a, uh, um, hearing issues uh you might want to you know wear your plugs that day or, or put in uh, your uh, your uh, uh airpods or something to help deafen that, uh, that noise we did have an interesting thing happen back uh three years ago we uh, uh a woman complaining of uh ringing of her ears tinnitus uh tonight's uh, uh discovered something when she went out to walk her dog and she came back in instead of hearing the cicadas you know rumbling ears her ringing of her ears was gone and she found that one, the the smaller of the two more predominant species singing, uh, we actually provided her with an audio tape that she could play on her phone as she walked her dog after the scales were gone because it actually quieted down the ringing of the ears. And I've had an audiologist talk about that, and they explained uh, how it works and, and how it relates to the same. It, it works on the same principle as, uh, as uh, noise-canceling headphones. Uh, so uh, that's something that we hope that somebody will study in the future. But uh, you shouldn't uh, be kept awake at night by the cicadas. Um, I have someone here who's, who must have musical training. Uh, she writes that in 2007 at the Immersion Sun, she says she remembers their singing centered on the in the key of E, but the annual cicadas sang at a somewhat higher pitch. Yes, indeed, there, there are the, of the three species. There's three species groups: uh, the Decim, the Cassini, and Decula. All their calls are very different. And uh, uh, the the pharaoh cicada, which has that sort of hollow pharaoh, uh, call, and the other one's more like a buzz and click and much like a tch, 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 sound. Uh, uh, their hearing is attuned for that, so they may not hear each other. We're not sure, but uh, 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 if if uh, you if you're musically trained and you can you can tell pitch, you go down to sun, you can go down to the overlap zone. And uh, even if you don't, just go down to Southern Illinois where brood uh, 19 is. And the two larger species have the same basic call, but they are at different pitches. And uh, people with a good ear and uh, good musical training can, can hear that difference. Unfortunately, I can't. <laughs> uh, somebody wants to know, um, in addition to saplings, will cicadas try to lay their eggs in woody shrubs? Yes. Uh, if, there's, new ones. yes yeah. if there are... Uh, again, uh, the thing about uh, they, they prefer trees. Uh, they'll fly into the tree more so. More so, but I have seen them uh, lay eggs in uh, in uh, viburnum. I've seen them lay eggs in uh, in rose bushes, but only in areas that are extremely dense with cicadas. And they usually, with the, I've not seen a shrub killed uh, by by uh, uh, cicada egg lying laying. I have seen small trees uh, being killed by, and then what goes on with those trees is they're so small, they have just a couple, two, three, four branches, and the cicada legs, the cicadas lay the eggs in all the branches. They all flagged, and the leaves turn brown, and the, the trees uh, starve to death. Um, when will the next double hatch happen in uh, like this? It's been uh, 200 and some years since yeah, the, the last one. The will next... it be at the same interval? The, the next time these two specific broods will emerge uh, together will be in in in, uh, in 221 years. And that'll be uh, uh, so. Uh, but uh, the next double emergence we have coming up. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's come over at uh, 240. Yeah, brood one uh, will emerge with uh, brood 22 in 2040. Uh, let's see, 28. Nope, only one second is on the 27. Yeah, um, 27. I've, I've, um, there's a chart in, in uh, Tale of Two Broods that lets you tell, these, uh, tell when they're going to happen together. Uh, but the next double, they don't happen that often. As I say, they happen about 30 times over every 220 years. So the next one will be about in 10, 10 to 20 years. We'll have a couple. Okay. Um, a couple questions about um, the timing of the emergence um, from that story that you told that cicadas can be tricked into thinking that it's spring when it's not. Um, it, you, we're having an extremely early spring, we think, um, around here this year. And um, um, do you think that it might affect the hatch time? I think we might see them before mid-May. Uh, it's it's hard to say. Basically, probably not. Uh, we had a very cool... Uh, 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 it's very, uh, I should say, we had a warmer uh, uh, spring uh, in 2021 for brood 10 uh, than normal. 
but they uh, but what what is going on it doesn't happen like they've got to mature the reproductive organs uh first so that's happened so right now if you're working in your garden you're going to find a cicada with red eyes but without those black patches uh behind the head they're coming out this year but not right away they develop those black patches shortly before they come out uh so uh but when you look at soil temperature uh it takes some days to get the soil temperatures up. Uh, so, for example, example today our high was up uh, uh, fifty four here, and the low was uh, twenty six. So that was a, that gave us an average. You take uh, based on uh, the average temperature is forty. So uh, it turns out the temperature at the cicada depth at the depth uh, three days before and two days before that average will help you predict what the soil temperature is if you don't have a soil temperature probe. But it takes a while. Uh, to get that soil temperature up there. Usually it's uh, after one or two uh, of the first days where you hit the low 80s and, and then uh, uh, give it a good rain. But it's not just the high that's important because the level where the skids are right now is insulated from the direct sunlight. It's not going to bake it that far down yet. So uh, okay. right so now... So soil temperature of 64 plus correct. adequate rain. Now, back okay. in, in the 1940, the average date for cicada emergences was the 28th, 29th of May here in Cincinnati. Now, three years ago, they came out. Some started coming out on the 13th of May. They came out really large in my backyard on the 17th. So on average, they're coming out two weeks earlier over the last century, which is the surprise. We have, we're having more research. So likely uh, that's taken years, but still it's in May. Uh, uh, the, we did have... Uh, uh, the first cicada that came out just south of Cincinnati on the 27th of April, but it was one. But the big emergence didn't harp, happen in big numbers uh, here until the uh, the second, uh, about th within the first 10 to 12 days of the of the month of May. Okay. A dog lover writes in, uh, what should we know about cicadas and dogs? Is it going to make their dogs sick? Well, cicadas? It's, it usually it won't. They're not. Many they're, but, it, but if you eat, if their dog is a gulper. <laughs> <laughs> and will eat and eat and never stop. It can lead to bowel uh, obstruction, and that's not not good. Uh, I, I I remember back in 1991 when Brood 14 emerged. I was visiting that site, and I saw on the first day of heavy emergence there was this the retriever just snappy at him like crazy. And uh, I went back five days later, and I saw him on the front porch of the house, heads on the paw, cicadas landing all around him. He was pretty much tired. <laughs> <laughs> of eating but, uh, lesson learned <laughs> no I, I i liken it to uh, i think the illustration i've mentioned before not not tonight but uh, uh it, what would you do if you walked outside and you found the world flying uh, filled with flying hershey's kisses i know what i do i eat a few but eventually you do get tired we're we're, we're, we're uh, of, of eating them and and uh, i've seen dogs and cats uh eventually turn their you know don't even, not even worry about it on the other hand, I've seen owls hopping on the ground, picking up the nymphs and the adults on the ground. I've seen uh, 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 chipmunks, which I've, I never would have expected, uh, run on my back deck and pick up cicadas and eat them like they're the best thing in the world. Uh, but eventually, <laughs> eventually, they do get tired of it. Um, well, speaking of eating cicadas, um, can they be eaten by humans? And if so, do you have any recipe suggestions? Well, I haven't eaten any periodical cicadas since 1987. And the reason for that is they got, they got me tenure. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm too fond of them. But uh, I, I, I three years ago, I was on an interview with a, a chef from New York who was out collecting hundreds of thousands of cicadas to freeze and have for, for uh, uh, different types of uh, recipes. Cicadas are not a sustainable food, even for the opportunistic predators. So uh, when you eat them, if you desire you to eat them, uh, you want to get them when they're all white before this exoskeleton is hardened, because otherwise that that exoskeleton is like the little tail of a shrimp that you hold when you're having a shrimp cocktail. Uh, it's 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 not easily digested. Uh, I do have uh, some uh, uh, some chefs have told me that they will they saute them so much that even that softens up. But uh, 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 there is one concern about cicadas, and that was a study done at the University of Cincinnati at the Department of Education and their engineering program found that cicadas collected from under that emerged up from under trees that a line like county roads uh, had a, 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 a very significant lead content because the lead was taken up in the groundwater into the tree and the cicadas were in it as well. And so therefore uh, uh, we don't, you know, the, we, we don't look forward or, or recommend eating cicadas. Uh, gotcha. 
thank you. Um, he, so someone else wants to know, um, why does it take cicadas so long to develop? And are there other insects that have such a long developmental period? That's a great question. Um, periodical scales, both the, the uh, 13 and 17 year numbers, those are those are prime numbers. And um, there are other periodical cicadas in the world, nowhere near related to ours all. There's one in Fiji with an eight year life cycle. There's another one in India with a four year life cycle. And that, that uh, four year cycle, the periodical cicada it came out every four once every four years uh usually in the same year as the world cup but when covid hit they delayed the world cup for a year and so it's now out of sync with the with the, with the cicada cup but the world cup cicadas uh, the leading uh hypothesis right now is that the long life cycle and there are other cicadas that have like a nine-year life cycle and the annual cicadas many of them probably have a seven-year life cycle uh is that uh if you look at the distribution of periodical cicadas is that as the ground started cooling in advance of the last ice uh, ice age, that would have selected for and favored lengthening of the life cycle. And if you look at the distribution of 17-year cicadas, they're all along the periphery where the ice sheets stopped uh, during the, the last ice age. And so they, uh, it's thought that the longer life cycle evolved in response to the uh, uh, gradual cooling uh, in the, uh, in the, as the ice sheet, moved south and then as it retreated there was selection for uh synchronized emergence that all what's really neat is we got seven species and they all emerge in the same you know this year in the same year they're all gonna be tied into this year that that synchrony and hatch uh but then also uh favoring broods not hybridizing so if they if some came out after 14 years we got or 15 years that would sort of dilute the the numbers that could survive and satiate predators and so the thought there's two thoughts that the, that the uh, having a prime number uh life cycle keeps the broods from interbreeding with other broods of their same life cycle the 17 year broods will never breed uh never come out at the same time as another brood for example uh, uh but um uh, the, also having a prime uh, number life cycle of 13 or 17 or a real long prime uh, number like that means it's next it's probably impossible for a predator to evolve to come out with the periodical cicadas you know we have annual cicadas and about a week or so after they start coming out we have the cicada killer wasps they come the the annual cicadas come out every year and so here's a wasp that's evolved to come out and feed on and provision its young uh, with a paralyzed cicada and we don't have that for the periodicals because it's such a long, uh, long uh, life cycle. So the cicada killing wasps don't go after the periodical cicadas? No, they don't usually, uh, in almost every instance, uh, the, the periodical cicadas are dead and gone by the time the cicada killer wasps come out. Oh. In fact, the <laughs> in 2021, uh, uh, the last periodical cicada I heard was on the 2nd of Jan of. Uh, july and about uh five six days later i heard my first uh, annual cicada and a, a week and a half after that i saw my first cicada killer wasp um one last question uh we have we have more but we're running out of time um someone wants to ask if you if you what you've learned about the symbolism of cicadas um you know it's it's a phenomenon that people have been witnessing for long time and also is there anything else that you've learned about them that's really surprised you one of the most frightening you know, the, I, I assume you can see this uh the i'm holding up a uh a carved wooden cicada is that is that visible for everybody yes nice yeah i bought this at the j next to the jade buddha temple in shanghai there's a little store that sold religious artifacts here you know so you find stores near catholic churches selling things like medals and and uh crucifixes what have you there was a shop selling symbols for buddhism and in buddhism when the nymphal cicada crawls out of the ground and up the tree sheds its skin oh splits its uh, exoskeleton and the all white adult comes out that is symbolic of the buddha reaching the next next level of understanding and shedding his earthly goods and back in the, starting in the Han Dynasty, and if you go to the Field Museum, they got several of these on display in the Jade Room. Uh, the the, the uh, uh, you'll find uh, instances of where uh, 
pieces of jade were carved into flat uh, tongue cicadas in the form of a cicada that was placed on the mouth of the deceased uh, to help ensure the resurrection of the deceased. Wow. Well, um, however you make sense of cicadas, uh, they are really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so thank you to, to Dr. Krisky for his um, his knowledge and his enthusiasm. I, I, I do encourage you to try the Cicada Safari app. And I've been to the cicadasafari.org website. It's full of fun stuff. I I think that, that uh, origami craft looks great. We may try that in the library as a sort of a drop-in craft. Um, um, but there are a lot of resources there. And um, um, so so uh, we'll all um, look for the drama to begin um, around the first week of June. And then we'll have about six weeks of of um, wall to wall cicadas. And then, and then it's over. Yeah. So I, I hope everyone enjoys it. Um, thank you, Dr. Krisky. Thank you, thank you. Um, also, again to our, our uh, sponsors, the Glencoe Sustainability Task Force and the Friends of the Green Bay Trail. Um, was there something else you wanted to say, Dr. Krisky? Um, well, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, even though they emerged last time in, in the first week of June, uh, start uh, monitoring your weather, keep an eye out uh, uh, for cicadas, get cicada safari and get ready to, to help map these things out. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much, everyone. Um, and um, we'll see you at the next one. Good night. Good night.